Once again, happy Mother's Day weekend to all of our moms, those of you who play special roles of mentors in our kiddos' lives. Thank you for all that you do. I would be telling a lie if I didn't say this, so I probably should say it and then explain. Perhaps maybe you also feel the same way, but I take my mom, I take my wife for granted. And so, mom, if you're watching, I love you very much. And I want to take this moment to simply say thank you for all of the prayers, all of the love, everything that you do behind the scenes that I don't even know about. I do know this, though, that every day I'm protected. I'm surrounded by angels because you are praying for me every single day. Thank you. Thank you. What is it about life? that we sometimes take for granted the very ones that we love. Last week, my wife Heather and my daughter Mia were in Catalina for a school trip. And so it was up to me to make sure to have Ethan dressed, have him have breakfast, make sure he brushed his teeth and go out the door. That's all that I had, just, just had that job of making sure that he gets to school on time. This is when I realized how much I take Heather for granted in the mornings. You see, I got everything ready, got his clothes out, Ethan is dressed, we have breakfast, we're doing great on time, and as we're getting ready to leave, Ethan says, what about my lunch? And I say, what about your lunch? <laughs> so we race back into the kitchen, and we make some good old peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and as Ethan is helping me make this is how bad I am in the kitchen. As he's helping me make these peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, he says, Dad, what about your lunch? And I said, well, don't worry about me, bud. You're the important one. And he starts to pull out this other piece of bread and takes my favorite jelly, and he begins to make me my lunch. And I realize that's all Heather. She's taught him well. <laughs> What is it about life that sometimes we find ourselves taking the very ones that we love for granted? So many times. I mean, honey, you don't even know. I mean, yes, thank you for trusting me with our son. But if it wasn't for our friends who provided pizza and all these other things, it would have been a different story. My, my, my. But I don't think I'm the only one that takes my loved ones for granted. I would say that we all take those we love for granted sometimes, right? How do we keep from taking the very ones that we love for granted? For just living life and then suddenly realizing, oh, I haven't talked to my mom in days, in weeks, in months. I haven't told my loved ones that I love them. I can't remember the last time. I think all of us fall into this trap of not saying I love you enough, taking for granted the ones that we love. So maybe it's just an earthly thing amongst us as humans, but I would venture to say that it also happens in our relationship with God, doesn't it? That We take God for granted. How do we keep from taking the ones that we love for granted? This morning, as we journey through two Bible stories, I believe that Scripture is going to provide a key, a solution, if you will, to helping us learn how not to take our loved ones for granted, in particular, how not to take God's love for granted. And so I want to leave this on the screen for just a moment. I'll explain it as we go through the service. But the idea, the key here, is to prioritize and not compromise. Turn to the person next to you and say, prioritize, don't compromise. All right, and then say to the person on the other side of you, prioritize, don't compromise. What does that mean? Well, let's go ahead and go to Scripture to find out. But first, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. God in heaven, thank you. In this moment, whether whatever came before or whatever comes after, in this moment, we just want to acknowledge that you are God, and we thank you for being love and for teaching us how to love you and others. Speak through your word this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Story number one. If you turn in your Bible with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke 7. And we're just going to read through this story. It's a short story. It shouldn't take too long. And then as we go through it in a little more detail, I hope that it begins to come alive for you. Luke chapter 7, as you can see, verses 11 to 16. I'm reading from the New American Standard. If you would read from your favorite translation. And here we go. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a city called Nain. And his disciples were going along with him, accompanying him by a large crowd. Now, as he was approaching the city gate, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was what? A widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was coming out with her. So when Jesus saw her, watch this, when Jesus saw her, he felt compassion for her. The Greek word compassion there is this gut feeling, just like, Oh, straight from inside. He felt compassion for her. And he said to her, Do not go on weeping. Something strange. Surely you and I wouldn't say that. But Jesus can. And he came up and touched the coffin, or the stretcher on which the boy lay. And the bearers came to a halt. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man, let me repeat that one more time, and the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all. And they began glorifying God, saying what? A great prophet has appeared among us. God has visited his people. God has visited his people. And so there's the story. That's story number one in its completion. And if you and I were to just take a moment to try to remember back what that story was, we'd probably only remember bits and pieces. Jesus, a widow, son, resurrection. Hooray, right? But there's so much more to this story. Take, for example, the distance that Jesus had to travel. In verse 1 of chapter 7, we realize that he's in Capernaum and that in verse 11, where our story begins, he's traveling all the way down to Nain. Now, those of you who have your phones out, I'm going to need your help. Here's a map. I know it's not that detailed. You can't see it very well. But here's a map. And in this map, we're going to look at, pull out your phones. Please, someone tell me, how far is the distance from Capernaum to Nain? Capernaum to Nain. One more time. 15 miles, okay. 15 miles. Interesting. That's interesting because I read 25, but that's okay. We're going to go with that. Moving on. If you were to, let's replace the 15 with 25 with 15, or roughly, let, let's run with 25 just for the sake of what, what I was finding earlier. Can someone tell me how long it takes to walk 25 miles? Okay, six hours. Anyone else find something different? One day, if my friend Kevin were here, he'd probably say five hours. (laughs) Between six to eight hours is the average time it takes to walk 25 miles. Now, depending on where Jesus was, I believe he was at the tail end of Capernaum. Historians tell us he traveled down to Nain, and it roughly takes about, let's say, about six hours. It might be shorter if it was 15 miles. But the point that I want to, for us to see is this. If it took Jesus a number of hours to get from Capernaum to Nain, it's no coincidence that he arrived exactly as the funeral procession was coming out of the city. That's not a coincidence. And watch as we go a little bit deeper into the story. You see, Jesus goes to the gate. That's interestingly enough the part of the city where lots of decisions are made. It's the most important place of decision-making in a city. And Jesus is coming to that place, and this crowd, this funeral crowd is coming to this place, and they're about to collide. 
And Jesus looks. And he sees a mom. He deduces that she is crying over her son. So he sees the mom. He sees the son. But what doesn't he see? He doesn't see the father. And in that moment, compassion stirs up within him. Do you know why? In those days, moms, wives, they were not allowed to own any property. They weren't allowed to have the inheritance passed down to them. So if the dad in the family died, the inheritance, all of it was passed down to the son. But if the son died and the mom was still alive, she would receive none of that. She would immediately become homeless and penniless and have to beg for the rest of her life. Not only is she, in this sense, losing her entire family in this moment, her husband is gone, her son is gone, she is losing the comfort of everything. She is out on the street. And Jesus, in this moment, sees her. And what does he feel for her? What was that, church? Compassion, deep compassion. And he begins to go through this process that is like no other story in the Bible about Jesus, which fascinated me when I went through this. First of all, he tells her not to weep. Again, something that you and I should never tell someone who is grieving. But Jesus has a reason for saying this. He is prioritizing this woman. He is prioritizing this mom. And he says, and it says that he came and he did what? He touched the stretcher on which the boy was, which you never do. In that society, touching a dead corpse, the coffin, if you will, that meant you had to remove yourself from society for a number of days to go through a ritual cleansing. You do not do that. There were strict laws against that. Jesus doesn't care. He tells the mom not to cry. He touches the stretcher and the people stand still. Then Jesus tells the young man, what? I love that. He tells the young man to get If you've been following, in the stories of Jesus, there are particular things that Jesus does before a healing, connecting faith with the person's healing. He might even perform a ritual, like bend down in the dirt, spit in the dirt, make kind of a clump of clay and place it on the eyes of the person who's being healed. He might ask the question, what can I do for you? Or what is it that you are looking for? He goes through this process this is the only story where Jesus does none of that. In fact, he doesn't even pray. When he resurrects Lazarus, he prays to the heavens and he says, Oh God, thank you for this moment to be able to reveal your power. But here, he just goes straight to the, to the young man and he tells him to get up. There's a purpose behind all of that. Jesus is prior, prioritizing this woman. And Jesus gave the son back to his mom. Look at the reaction of the crowd. Whoop. And they began glorifying God, saying, great, a great prophet has appeared among us. But I don't want you to miss the point that from Capernaum all the way down to Nain, X number of hours that he had to travel, he gets there, he knows exactly why he's there. He goes directly to the coffin and does what he does because he prioritizes this mom in pain. I think sometimes when we celebrate Mother's Day, Father's Day, special occasions, we think only of the positive, unless something has happened in our past to make us think otherwise. And for all of us who have lost moms, this day is looked at differently. For all of us ladies in the congregation, for those of you who long to be a mom but are not a mom, this day hits differently. And for those of you who've lost a child who was a mom, they, as you kind of begin to see the perspective change, 
this day, this weekend, holds a different feeling attached to it. And for those of you who are hurting today, I want to pause here for a moment and say that the same Jesus who was there prioritizing this mom in her pain and in her anguish prioritizes you as well. He loves you very much. You may say, well, Pastor Walter, that doesn't ease the pain. No, most likely does not ease the pain. And there's more to this than what we're seeing here in this moment. But if you look, the people in this moment, they celebrate and they call Jesus a great prophet. And you'd think that that's not necessarily a bad thing, which Luke points out a little bit more detail but in this moment we'll just say that they're super excited they say what a great prophet has risen among us because there's a particular legend that was told in this part of the world because of something that had happened 800 years earlier and i invite you to read about that later on the sabbath in the afternoon after lunch go ahead and open your bible up read second kings chapter four if you need to write that down please write it down as a reference so that you can read it later on because i'm just going to take bits and pieces from this story but here's what i find interesting some 800 years earlier in the ninth century bc there is a mom who is racing down the dirt roads towards this particular mountain called mount carmel and as we pick up the story in verse 24 She's commanding her servant, drive the donkey, go on. Do not slow down. The pace for me unless I tell you. So she went on and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. Roughly some 20 miles from where she lives. She's looking for this particular prophet. A great prophet of renown who has done amazing things and she's headed specifically for him she's prioritizing everything around this prophet watch the wording here in verse 27 she came to the man of god at the hill and took hold of his feet this is how serious she was this was not something she'd ever done before nor something that she ever did again because this was not customary between the the cultures of the prophet and her culture but she is serious, she is prioritizing, and she then says, as surely as the Lord lives, you yourself live, I will not, what? Leave you. Here's where it gets interesting. Church family, we just looked at story number one where all these people called Jesus a great prophet. Now we're going back in time to the legend in which this great prophet did an amazing thing in history. But if we peel back the curtain just a little bit, we realize that it's the woman, the mom, the mother who is doing all the heavy lifting. She's the one going and finding the prophet. She's the one saying, I'm not going to take your servant whom you're sending to take care of my son in this situation. I want you. You're the one that I want to go take care of the situation because she is prioritizing the one that she loves. Something that I find very fascinating is that when Elisha, the prophet, is talking to his servant, because the servant tries to pry her off of his feet, she, he says, leave her alone for her soul is troubled within her and the Lord has concealed it from me and has not informed me. These people call Jesus a prophet. They give much regard to the prophet. But this prophet doesn't know what he's doing. That might be hard to swallow it was really hard for me to understand because this is Elisha, the one who has the double portion of God's Holy Spirit. But in this moment, and this is how the, the Bible paints human beings, as imperfect, needing help, Elisha does not know what God wants him to do in this moment. So he sends his servant. But his servant isn't able to do anything for this young boy. Then it's Elisha's turn. 
he enters the house, he shuts the door behind him, and he goes through this process. Again, read it later on today when you have some time. He goes through this process. He pleads with God. He prays. And then he does some weird sort of ritual. Doesn't quite work. So he stands up and he paces back and forth. I can only assume that as he's pacing back and forth, he's praying and he's pleading with God. Then he goes through the ritual again. And finally, the boy comes back to life. Something unheard of, by the way. A resurrection happening in the Old Testament. Then he calls the mom and he said to her, pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went on. You say, Pastor Walter, why are you even telling this story? I thought we were talking about Jesus in Nain. 800 years later on in the future, why are you going back in time? Well, I wouldn't have made the connection between these two other than the resurrection of two children who were, you know, resurrected by great people. If it weren't for geography, because the map told me that the city of Shunem, where this woman was, and the city of Nain are basically in the same spot. Historians tell us that the city of Shunem, by the time, as time went on, it merged and the people moved into the hill country and they became the city of Nain. Shunem was no longer. By the time Jesus was on earth, there was no Shunem, just Nain. But it was the same descendants upon descendants of the descendants of those who were alive during the time of Elisha. So when the story, for them it's legend, a great prophet performed this great miracle. But for us it's scripture. It was Elisha. It was this woman's faith. It was this mother's priority. Which brings us back to the story of Jesus when they say a great prophet has appeared among us. But that's not what Luke is trying to tell us with this story. Because Jesus is no ordinary prophet. Or he's not just a prophet. Think back for a moment. Elisha didn't know what he was supposed to do. He went through a process of rituals and prayers. He couldn't resurrect this boy on his own. Who was the one who could re resurrect this boy? Anyone? God right? Jesus. Jesus was the one who had the power to resurrect this boy. Elisha had to depend on him. That's the only way that that was going to work. But now fast forward 800 years later, here's Jesus. Does he need to depend on anybody? Does he need to go through rituals to make this happen? Now he depends on his heavenly father because he's showing us an example. But in this one story, he bypasses all things and goes straight to the situation. I find it most fascinating that this is the story where a Gentile author, meaning he's not a Jew, decides to make it plain to his audience that he believes that Jesus is the Messiah. What do I mean by this? Nowhere in the Bible up to this point, up to this story, does Luke call Jesus Messiah does Luke call Jesus Lord? As an author, he could have put that anywhere. Instead, he says the angels call him Lord. Instead, he says all these other people call him Lord. But here, for the very first time, Luke decides to call Jesus Lord. And he writes it this way. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her. Which means Luke, being a Gentile, non-descendant of Abraham, is staking his claim calling Jesus Lord. And he's inviting those, his listeners, those who are Gentiles, those who are not of the Jewish faith, he's inviting them to see Jesus through new eyes. He's no ordinary prophet. No, he is the Messiah. If you take a moment just to look at the word Lord, it means to place oneself under another person, to give value over yourself to them, or to what? Prioritize them first. So you say, Pastor Walter, how do I keep from taking my loved one, my loved ones for granted? Prioritize them. Now I'm going to take a moment here 
to speak to what it means to make Jesus Lord, what it means to prioritize him in your life. I should say what it's not. Prior, prioritizing Jesus in your life is not, okay, Jesus, I'm going to give you my heart one day out of the week for about three hours out of the day. And I'm going to worship you. And I'm going to praise you. And then we have this thing where as soon as that's done, I'm going to go do my own thing. That's not prioritizing God. That's not prioritizing Jesus. When it comes to making decisions of growing deeper in your walk with Jesus or doing things your own way, if you prioritize Jesus, that's one thing. If you prioritize yourself, don't go around telling people that Jesus is number one in your life if he's not. Instead, take the challenge of what it means when he says, I love you and I want you, all of you, not half of you, not a third of you. I want all of you because I know what's best for you. Jesus prioritized you when he gave up his life for you. He chose you over himself. So to prioritize the one you love, what does that look like for you? It's probably very different than the person sitting next to you. I can't tell you. Here's what it means to prioritize Jesus. Write these things down. No. You have to understand that in your own relationship with God. Prioritize the one you love. If there's anything else I would say to that is, well, don't compromise that. Because it's so easy. It really is. And all it takes is a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, and then, Mom, I'm sorry I haven't talked to you on the phone for... Right? Because day after day... Things separate us from the people that we love. That's why we prioritize. We prioritize. A number of years back, I found a poem. It's actually a letter that just hit me really hard. The title is called The Wide Spectrum of Mothering. And there's the link on the screen if you'd like to find it and keep it. I encourage you to look over it this weekend. I'm going to read this, and I'm going to try to make it without, without crying, because there are several examples in this that I've seen in my church families throughout the years. So please know that moms, we prioritize you in this church. We love you. We appreciate you. And here we go. To those who give birth who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes and prods and tears and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make it harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children. We sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way that you longed it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, Yet that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who will have empty nests in the upcoming year, 
we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children up for adoption, we commend you for your selfless and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart. And we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you. So, children, prioritize your mom. Husbands, prioritize your wife. Church family, prioritize the mothers in our church. And in so doing, may you catch a a glimpse of what it means to prioritize our one and true love. May you this week take on the challenge to prioritize the one that you love. And may you find all things falling into place. Let's pray. God in heaven, I thank you so very much for making a clear path right to our heart, for removing all obstacles to save us. And Lord, I just ask that you do one more thing for us, that you'd help us to clear all things out of the way so that we might have a direct path straight to your heart. Help us, Lord, to prioritize you above all other things. Thank you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.